welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Brian Michael. That would make me Angela Yeager. And this is a very special episode. I know we always say that, but this is extra special. This is our favorite films, top five of the past decade. The last episode, we looked at numbers 10 through six. This episode, we will be counting down to our, from number five down to our top film of the decade. And we count the decade as 2010 through 2019. Brian and I have watched a lot of the films over the years, and so this is really hard to do, but these are films that we personally loved that we have come back to over and over again. And so we hope you enjoy this and find some um, special movies to watch uh, on streaming, because a lot of these are available. So my number five film is the one that started off the decade for me. This is from 2010, and this is Winter's Bone by Deborah Granick. This is the film that in our original episode, Brian could not stop laughing because of the word bone and because he's 10 years old. So um, this is not a laughing movie, however. This is a film that uh, launched Jennifer Lawrence's career um, and just features some amazing performances. Um, one of the things that I especially love about this film, I rewatched it again recently, I own it, is the wonderful sense of place, the authenticity of the Ozarks where Deborah Granick filmed and the way of life of a very specific group of people, in this case, people that are extremely suspicious of the police, of authorities, and um, where life has not gone so well for them. Mm. And it's a mystery and a thriller wrapped up into sort of a political movie of sorts. Deborah Granick has gone on to make several other fantastic films, including the criminally underrated Leave No Trace, filmed right here in Oregon, and continues to be a director who's very interested in the lives of rural people, of people uh, who have been left behind economically. And I love, love this movie. I was really surprised. I rewatched it because I wanted to see how well it had aged, you know. Jennifer Lawrence, of course, has become a superstar since this movie. And it still really holds up, which I was happy to see. Yeah, this is a fantastic film. And, and uh, I just remember the, the character actors they brought in to really fill up that world and create that world um, were just absolutely spot on. And I absolutely just, you know, th th this film was an incredible film. I didn't give it four stars at the time. I have not seen it since that time. So I'm not 100% sure. But I, I remember, of course, you having it as your number one. And I remember laughing the entire episode. And we just kept filming because there was no yeah. reason. To stop. Well, just like you did this time. So <clears throat> there you go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my number five is from 2014. It's a uh, Dan Gilroy's Nightcrawler. Hmm. Uh, so uh, not only is this film a fantastic uh, piece of work in terms of mood and look, most of it, most of it is shot at night. This is definitely a film noir. Um, but Jake Gyllenhaal uh, lost weight for the role, which is the first thing you think of. But you know, he, this is where he really found his stride in the last decade and just becoming one of the best actors of his generation. And, um, and as fantastic as he is, when I watch this movie, Rene Russo comes oh, in yeah. and just hits back just as hard and, and is just as good as he is as a news producer who's actually been in several different networks. This is probably her last gig. And so he kind of has um, the world by the tail in terms of, of uh, getting what he wants from her. And uh, they have some amazing uh, scenes of dialogue going back and forth where the power s has switched and um, some things are revealed just in certain conversation, not having a, the, the, you know, a scene start with the morning after or whatever it has, uh, you know, it's happened that they refer to. It's just dropped in a conversation. I thought it was just exquisitely done. Uh, Bill Paxton, of course, I think, I think this was his last role or one of his very last roles. A, a good friend of mine, I met one. Uh, Bill Paxton um, is, is, is great in this, but uh, also what this film has to do with the, with the bleeds that leads in terms of uh, news and certainly news media in the last 10 years have grown, has grown into really weird sections and portions and we're getting news from all kinds of different sources and it's just really strange and when I watch this film it's just it's really depressing so my my top 10 list is kind of hard to watch a little bit at times <laughs> yeah between this one and we need to talk about Kevin you're going to some dark places Brian yeah I remember really liking this movie when it came out I haven't seen it since then um Jake Gyllenhaal is a guy who could have just begun on his looks and become a, a movie star really and he seemed like he was going in that direction after broke book back mountain and then he just started making one more esoteric film after another and choosing weirder and weirder roles you think about movie like enemies end of watch 
um, Nightcrawler. Um, then he, oh, he did Okja with Bong Joon-ho and Tilda Swinton. And he really is just decided, nope, that's not the way I'm going. I just want to make weird, quirky movies with really great directors. And you can't, you can't fault him for that. I believe that he reteamed with this director uh, and Rene Russo for a film called Velvet Buzzsaw, which is on Netflix, which I still haven't seen. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, really, really interesting movie, really dark. Yeah. So we'll move on to my number four film, uh, which I believe, uh, Brian, you said maybe made your top 100, <laughs> but not definitely not your top 10. The movie is Phoenix uh, by the German director Christian Petzold. This was my number one film of that year. Um, as soon as it came out on Criterion DVD, I bought it. Um, you know, recently on the Criterion channel, this uh, filmmaker, all of his work, films were featured. He is um, his muse, Nina Haas, the actress, has starred in all of his movies. And um, you can really see him building up to the masterpiece that is Phoenix. He made a bunch of terrific mysteries before he made this film. If there's so many people that rip off Hitchcock, it's just the most common thing. Filmmakers love to rip off Hitchcock and very few do it well. I will not say that he's ripping off Hitchcock, but this is the best Hitchcockian type movie I've seen in a really long time. It brings in all the things that make Hitchcock great, but gives it his own flavor. In this case, it's about a woman who is a Holocaust survivor who assumes a new identity. Um, so there's like definitely some strains of vertigo going on here with Hitchcock. You know, you have these issues of identity, but in this case, with so much power invested in them because of the fact that it's about from about the Holocaust, Nina Haas gives, um, she gives great performances in all of his films, but this one in particular, and it has this great film noir look to it that's just fantastic. And the ending is one of the great endings in fil any film I've seen in a long time. That's what I remember most about the film is just the ending and what happens there is it, it was, uh, I think it was the same year as Whiplash, wasn't it? And I thought it was the two great FUs, so to speak, at the end of the film that was just like they just dropped it, dropped the mic and walked out the room. And I thought that was... Uh, Bam, mic drop. Yeah, exactly. And endings are so hard for films. There's so many great films that you and I have seen that we're like four stars up until the ending and then they can't nail the landing, as we like to say. And so to see a satisfying ending is um, is rare, actually. Well, I usually say it has a stick of landing. This one punches it pretty darn good. And this is in between Ida and Bridesmaids on my top 108 films of the decade. So I look forward to posting that pretty soon. So my number four is my favorite family film um, of, of, of the lighter affair of all the films in my top 10 is Shoplifters from 2018, mm. directed by, oh, I'm going to... Uh, Kira Kuzo, Kuzu uh, Karita, who, who also made Afterlife, which is my favorite film of 1998. And what this film does is, you know, this family, I'm gonna use quotation marks, is a family, but as we, as the film kind of goes along, you start to realize, wait, what, how is this family exactly united? How is this related? What's, what's kind of going on here? And it's another one of those films that, you know, it's smart because it keeps me thinking, which means it holds my attention, uh, which you don't mm -hmm. do. And um, it just kind of unfurls as it goes along and we start to learn who is who in this family, their relationships with one another, how they've come to this certain situation. And as that's happened, life is continuing. A death occurs that's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, uh, different things in life, uh, different lessons. Um, when a shop, my favorite scene is certainly when that shoplifter turns and goes, don't teach her that. Mm -hmm. It was just mind blowing. I mean, that was just such a, 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 a fantastic scene. Um, there's a great scene that'll make me cry if I talk about it too much, where the mother has a conversation. Yep. At the jail. That gets me every single time. Um, this film is actually on Hulu and it's been on Hulu for some time. It's an incredible film. It is in a foreign language, so you have to read along. But the, the relationships that you will see and, and bear witness to are just so touching. I always think of the, also the father has the conversation on the beach with his son about becoming a man and what exactly that I means. love that scene. That's one of my favorite scenes, yeah. And it, but Angela, the way we talked about this so much, just the way he handles it, makes a, you know, asks a question, answers a question, and they move on. It's not made this big, huge production. It's not this huge, you know, mm -hmm. it's just so beautifully done. And, and I, I just love, love this movie. This could have been my number one. You know, for the decade, this is where it really, really got up. 
I think I just yeah my top three I've had solidified for a long time yeah shoplifters is a great film Karita is one of our best filmmakers I would say um, he's made several films this last decade including um, our little sister which I also loved and shoplifters and then the previous decade he made just one terrific film after another so he's definitely one of our greatest living filmmakers in my opinion so so we'll move on to my number three film, which is a horror film. And this was a great decade for horror. I could have had a top 10 just of horror films, which I can't say that for, for every genre necessarily that I gave four stars to. But this one is the one to beat. It is Jordan Peele's Get Out from 2017, a movie I've rewatched quite a few times and talk about giving new meaning to the term Black Lives Matter. Um, this one movie is so brilliant. It's the writing is fantastic. It's clever, but it's not just clever for clever's sake. Sometimes you see a film and like, yes, it's very clever in terms of the writing and it's very impressed with itself, but this movie is clever in a way that matters and is deep. The performances are fantastic across the board from small parts like Lakeith Stanfield, fantastic actor in a smaller part, and Catherine Keener, um, to of course, all the lead characters. And um, it's also very funny. It's a horror film, essentially, but it also has very funny moments and it's also not dumb. Unlike most horror movies that play down to you, this is a smart movie. You have to, you have to keep, it keeps you on your toes as you're watching it. And um, yeah, go ahead. This film is like Jenga. I recently rewatched it because I showed it to my mom because I'm a horrible son. And she loved it, but it scared her. And um, this movie is like Jenga. You can't, you, you pull out a scene in this film and it doesn't work because so many things, this is such an airtight script that everything that happens has right. a positive effect that happens later on. Even the effect that why they're pulled over and she throws a, you know, a white privilege fit over why do you have to see his driver's license? Well, because he wasn't driving and also because she doesn't want to have a record of him being there because later on that's going to be a problem. So, I mean, there's just so many things that go back and forth and it's just a spider web and it's just as beautiful and intricate and just as sturdy as that. Um, it wasn't my favorite horror film. It was my second favorite horror film. I have it in between It Follows and Booksmart, uh, which is fitting because it's a horror film and it's a comedy there. So what number would it be for you? So it was number 17, but... That's too low. Well, hold on. It was number number eight that particular year. It should have been in the 80s, so to speak, ish. So it leapfrogged the most of any film. Trust me, I could have could have I could have had it my number 10. I thought about putting it as my number 10. It was that it's it's that's that tough. But then you know you've got her social network parasite sort of project. It gets really hard, people. So um, yeah, this I I love this film. I knew you would have it in your top 10, so at least I didn't have to worry about that. Um, it's it is an incredible film. Sadly, us followed it and it was seemed not as good because of it. And if it had done the other way around, we would have said us is a masterpiece and then he really knocked it out with Get Out. So, you know, I look us forward to it. Us is still a great film. I, I think it, you, know, you underrated it a little bit. I think it's just hard when you, you following up a movie as good and as perfect as Get Out. It's really difficult to do. Perfect. A perfect yeah. film. Uh, so my number three, uh, I hate talking about this movie because it's the movie that always makes me cry. Uh, Manchester by the Sea from 2015, uh, directed by Kenneth uh, Largan. Uh, this is this, I think, yes, this is the best uh, script, uh, in my opinion, uh, of the last decade. Um, and one of the great performances, great performances by Casey Affleck, right up there. Michelle Williams, who's really good, did it in a, in a certain scene that's really good. I don't want to talk about too much about it. But uh, she absolutely gets the 15 seconds of the movie and just really knocks it out of the park and he's right there with her. Um, this is another one that's told in flashbacks that were kind of like, what's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. person and what's, the tra what's going on? What happened here? And then we find that we get closer and closer and closer and then the tragedy is, is uh, on display, much like, um, you know, uh, we need to talk about Kevin. That's just heartbreaking, horrible, awful. And then when you re-see the film, you see the different reactions he gets from people that, you know, have different, um, uh, reactions to, to seeing him or being around him. It's very, very interesting. Another film about grief. Can't help it. Can't get around it. I can't help it at all. But um, I absolutely love this film. To say it's a beautiful film is really tough. It's a cold looking film um, done in, the, in New England. Certainly it's a very difficult uh, subject matter. And, that, and I really appreciate that. Casey Affleck just holds this whole picture on his shoulders. Um, mm. Incredible performance. I deserve the Academy Awards. And um, I look forward to this as another director who just makes a movie like every seven years or something. 
Uh, yeah, he does. Kenneth Lonergan doesn't make too many movies, but. You can Count on Me is still one of my all time favorites. So if you had to do a best of the century, that would be in my top 100 easily. Um, but uh, yeah, here's another film that's just absolute standout. Great film, great performances. Um, yeah, I was thinking about our top 10 lists, and um, you have a lot of films about grief, about looking back. Um, yeah, a lot of grief, a lot of dark, uh, dark, dark subjects. And me, you know, well, political and class issues, race issues, et cetera. But um, it's interesting to think about the themes, the things that appeal to us. We're gonna, after the episode, we're gonna, we're gonna count up our scores here because I made sure I looked at mine in a particular way that we'll talk about. Okay. I didn't know that you did that, so that's interesting. Um, as I mentioned, I just went with personal favorite movies that I was able to come back to um, and watch again. So um, speaking of which, number two on my list is Moonlight, which Brian um, talked about that made in his list for the 10 through six on our previous episode. This one ranked a little higher. For me, it was my number one film of that year, uh, 2016, uh, Barry Jenkins. Gosh, I had two films of his on my top 10 list. So yes, I'm a big fan of his movies. Moonlight is a perfect film. It's a gorgeous film um, from the cinematography and the music to the performances. It is really difficult to have three actors who look really different play the same character. He, he does that on purpose. He picks three actors to play the different ages of the lead character of Chiron um, who don't look anything alike but and somehow inhabit and embody the spirit of what that character was going through at that time from his very youngest age when he was a scrawny kid who was picked on and went by the name of Little to him as an adult when we see him later and he's everyone calls him black and he's buffed out you know big guy tough but inside, way down deep inside, he's still that scrawny, frightened kid with an abusive mother. So the movie gets about issues of abuse, of course, also another movie about identity, um, and of course him grappling um, with his sexual awakening uh, in one of the most, and again, a film to me that nails the ending. It's a perfect ending to me, it's poignant and heartfelt, and I cry every single time I see the movie. Um, and it's hopeful, which I really like. Uh, whoever wrote the, the wrote the line "more athletic" when he's being taught to swim has my forever gratitude. Um, as a gay man, that's something that you thought about an awful lot. So to have that mentioned in the film was such—I mean, that I about fell over and almost was like, "Can we take a break? Hold on, we need an intermission. I gotta regroup here because that was like that really hits to the heart uh, of the matter there." Uh, so we're going to get real dark now with mine. We're going to go into another noir film here, uh, a 2011's Drive, uh, directed by Nicholas Winding Refn, I always mess up his name, who I've been waiting to, I really was hoping he would do something else uh, this last decade with the heat he had from that film um, to make a, a, another a, a great film. But this is certainly a, a noir film. This is the first time I saw Oscar Isaac and went, who's that guy? And then the more I watched the film, I went, who's that guy? Who's that guy? This guy is going to be, this guy is awesome. And Carrie Mulligan, who I really enjoy, and all she has to do is just stare lovingly at, at Ryan Gosling, which is pretty darn easy to do, not because he's also another pretty boy that could have easily went, and he has yet to play a superhero, right? But he could have easily went the Hollywood way and found, just wanted to go off the rails. He just took the Neil Young way and just went, just drove towards the ditch. And um, this is where we learned that Ryan Gosling, I think it was the same year, was that same 365 days he did the March of Ides and then he also did Crazy Stupid Love or something like that. He had three amazing films, but what we found out was that, you know, as much as we like to see his mouth move, he doesn't need to talk. And mm. here where he has like 10 lines or something and just fantastic and is intimidating and is scary, <laughs> which is the, the things you would not describe as, you know, Ryan Gosling, really, the Mouseketeer. I absolutely love this film. Um, just be the score, I, I listened to it just the other day. I have the score and the soundtrack. Uh, the look of it is just beautiful. Um, you have Brian Cranston in a supporting role. Uh, you have Albert Brooks in a supporting role. You have um, uh, Neil or, um, Ron Perlman. Um, just everything in this movie just is just the best. And I, I really don't think you could um, uh, cast it many other different ways. But I love the look of this film. I saw it three times in the theater. It was supposed to be a Fast and the Furious movie. It was what people expected. Someone sued the studio because it wasn't that. The elevator scene still haunts me to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not a Fast and the Furious movie. I think the name Drive was misleading. 
Yeah, and so, and, um, uh, oh, and I'm, I'm now forgetting another actor. But anyway, uh, yeah, but uh, I saw it in the theater, and I just remember after the elevator scene, the whole mood changed immediately. And I think even Brian leaned towards me and went, whoa, what happened? I'm like, hey, this is different. What's going on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love this film. I've watched it many times. I've owned it. Um, it's now available on Netflix, I think. So what This filmmaker uh, has done several other films since then. They've all been disappointments. Um, he started to opt for more style over substance, and that's too bad, because you can see this film kind of teetering in that direction. It's very stylized. Um, but with films like The Neon Demon and, gosh, what was that other one he did with all the red? I just remember the red. Um, he's really gone over with the top with the stylization, but this is a great performance. Ryan Gosling, very under, uh, I don't think he's underappreciated. Obviously he's a huge movie star, but he does a wide range, which you don't see that often anymore. He can do drama, comedy, musicals, dancing, singing. He does it all. A fantastic decade. Boy, he might've actually really knocked it out of the look at my list, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, like with La La Land and Crazy Stupid Love, I mean, he does romantic comedies. Not that many actors in this modern age do that variety the way that the old actors like Harry Grant used to. So it's interesting to think about and have those kind of looks. So uh, so we'll move on to our number one. This is it, the best film, the my favorite film of the decade. Brian probably won't be too surprised by this one. Uh, my favorite film of the decade is The Florida Project by Sean Baker. It was my number one film of that year. I love this movie more than probably anyone else on the planet, maybe even more than Sean Baker does. <laughs> um, I think this is a film that nobody else loves as much as I do. I feel like when I talk about it and I get people to watch it, they'll watch it and go, yeah, that was good, but they don't seem to have take it to heart the way I do when I've told a lot of people about it, um, friends and family, not you, but other people. <laughs> no, no, I'm amazed that people will be like, it was good. I'm like, Good. It's my number 15. It's between Parasite and It Follows, which, yeah. That's pretty high, yeah. I love this movie. I guess it's everything from, you know, following this precocious character of Mooney, who is a child, who is not a child actor in the way that we think of it. She's annoying. She's trouble. She's got lots of problems. Her mother, who um, the character of Hallie, is troubled as well. Um, and then Willem Dafoe in his brilliant performance that he should have won an Oscar for as the um, landlord who um, is the is the landlord of this hotel that they live in. And this is really a film about the class of Americans that we don't get to see very often. People who aren't quite homeless, but are literally living hand to mouth. And in this case, in the shadow of Disney World behind them and all of the dreams of America, just an arm length away and the helicopters from the tourists circling above their existence. And it's a film about a mother who loves her daughter very much, but just doesn't know how to be a good parent. And I think, you know, for those of us who work in social services, we see these kinds of situations. It's very heartbreaking. But he also doesn't make, this isn't neo-realist. Uh, Sean Baker paints this movie with these vibrant colors. And it's also a gorgeous to look at movie. It doesn't have to be, it's not depressing looking because it's Florida. <laughs> so, you know, it's real, it, it's, it's sunny but the subject matter is dark, which I think is very interesting. I love this movie. It's hard for me to talk about it. I love it so much. <laughs> My favorite line of the movie is why we learn to cook when hamburgers are a dollar, um, which really floored me. I, I'd seen that with Daniel and uh, that was the, the point he made. And I thought, oh God, that's, yeah, that's very true. And then he also commented on um, the ending, the happy ending. He felt the ending was happy and, um, they, well, I mean, it's a really interesting yeah. conversation because you it can- It seems inevitable, I would say. <laughs> thing was that was heartbreaking. It was a sad ending. And he was like, no, that's a good thing. That's the way things are supposed to work. That's how society happens. And that's why we have those systems put in place. So yeah. that's really interesting. And um, I, know, I love Tangerine, which is Sean Baker's other film. God, I love, I am so looking forward to this man making a comic book movie. No, I'm, I'm so looking forward to his next project because he's probably making it right now on his phone anyway. You just get, you know, people do the social distance from and they can make a movie together and there you go. But um, uh, yeah, it's a really, when you watch those back to back, there's a great double feature of Tangerine with the Florida Project. And yeah, he's a great filmmaker. So I can't wait to see his next one. At the same time. So yeah. So we're going to move on to my number one. Angela knows what my number one is. Come on. We all know what my number one is. What is it, Angela? Do you know? Are you stumped? Mad Max. Dang right. 2015 Mad Max Fury Road. Directed by George Miller, who came out of nowhere after making Happy Feet movies and a couple of Babe movies that I really love. Um, uh, this is a uh, 
misleading film because of the title and it just threw Angela all off because it said Mad Max, but it's about a woman, which is what she wants in every film anyway. So I don't see what the complaint is. Uh, this does have a, a female action lead. Another female action, another lead in my movie. Oh, interesting top 10, Brian. Uh, by Charlize Theron, who by the way, yeah, she can do that. I'm pretty sure she can sing and dance too if she wanted to. <laughs> and uh, she comes in with a steely performance there's like 10 lines, I think, for everybody in this movie uh, when you subtract, uh, you know, the main plot. And uh, Tom, uh, Tom Hardy, who is another great actor here, um, but this is a director's, uh, another director's picture. The look of this film, the feel, mm -hmm. um, it's a film that you watch and it is hot. It feels hot. It's a great chase film. You know, if you couldn't, didn't think you'd make a better film than Mad Max Road Warrior, you know, Mad Max 2 Road Warrior, but this is the reincarnation of that. And the imagination, you think of the people on the poles that come back and forth, that blew my mind when I saw this in the theater. You think of the different worlds, bullet world, there's water world, there's all these other different worlds that are all around um, that I thought were fantastic and interesting, the different tribes um, after a, a, a post-apocalyptic world. And um, I just absolutely love that. And there's a great, well, I mean, there's a chase all the way through this film and it just constantly keeps you on your toes. You've got the rhythm and the amazing electric guitar that spews fire. I um, love the guitar. <laughs> you gotta love that. And Scott to this day goes, you wouldn't have that. And I said, you use drums all the time in War to Intimidate. And that would scare the hell out of me. Are you kidding uh, it's me? It's not about realism. This is gonzo filmmaking. This is just yeah. fantastical spectacle. Yeah, this is on TNT. And you can turn it on at any time and just go, oh yeah. And you just sit and watch it. And if it repeats, you're like, well, I'll just watch the beginning and get catch up to where I started. And sure, that's fine. I can totally watch the bookend, bookend, or or either way, you know, all mixed up in a jumble. I think you've probably seen this movie what 20, 30 times, Brian, knowing you. I saw it three times in the theater, including a three D version, which was fine. And then I've watched it. You know, I own it, so I've probably watched it a good five, six times, and then I had it in the background three or four times. I mean, I've, yeah, I've watched double digits easily for this film. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a lot of fun. It's very <laughs> visual. Yeah. This is the reason you go to the theater. You want to see a big, huge spectacle. There's always intimate you know, films to watch, certainly like something like Drive, but then there's ones where you just go, yeah, this is pretty amazing. And then when you see how much of it was actually special effects, and it's the stuff that you think of special effects aren't, and the things that you didn't suspect were special effects are. Love this movie. Love. Makes you miss, uh, makes you miss uh, going to the theater for sure. Okay, so I think Brian froze. I don't see Brian yeah. anymore, but I'm going to go yeah. ahead. Oh, there he is. Your screen froze. Sorry, Brian, on right. my end. So I'm going to wrap up. That was our top five, our favorite films of the decade. We hope you enjoyed it and have some good movies to check out. Um, you can always check us out on our website, realfilmsnobs.com, Facebook, and Twitter. We're here in Salem on CC Media in Silverton on Scan TV, Corvallis Access Media, and on KMUZ Radio. Um, as always, I'd like to thank our fantastic crew working remotely and Brad for taping the show and our amazing sponsors for supporting the show and my wonderful and charming co-host, Brian. Uh, so thank you for watching. Have a great day and great movies.